Okay, cool. Um, so I've actually changed the title slightly, <laughs> as you do. Um, and uh, I'd kind of like to talk about um, kind of the wider um, open source community, um, kind of how, how it operates, um, how we, people can get involved. And I'll try and illustrate um, my points with um, some practical experience that we've had. Um, I, uh, I got up this morning and uh, had some breakfast. My son said, uh, Dad, what are you doing today? He's only, only five before he went to school. And I said, I'm going to go and uh, go into an event. I'm going to be talking to some people. He said, oh, you're going to be talking to people about computers. That's what I normally do. And um, I said, actually, uh, today I'm kind of talking about computers, but it's kind of more about the, the fluffy, touchy-feely human side. Um, because open source... Um, there's a lot of focus on kind of the software and um, the physical stuff that, um, that we all use. We download and use software. But um, a really important aspect is, is the community. It's kind of what makes um, open source work, and it's one of the big differentiators between open source and, and proprietary software. It's very much a, um, a community where everybody can be involved, um, be you um, a user of a single piece of software or someone that's been involved in a particular community contributing heavily for, for many years. Everyone is kind of on an equal um, footing to, uh, to pitch in and uh, make life that little bit better. So that's what I'm hoping to, to cover today. Um, myself, a bit of background, um, I've kind of been involved in, in the open source community probably for around six years or so, um, perhaps a little longer, um, um, both professionally and personally. Um, I'm one of these people that uh, both has a, a profession which involves computers and um, writing software and the likes, and also a hobby, which um, is sometimes a bit challenging, a lot of screen time, but um, quite lucky to have found a profession that uh, you can uh, both enjoy and, um, and earn a living from. Um, I've been with, uh, with Aston for, uh, I think, probably about three years now, um, and actually one of my reasons for moving to Aston was the... Um, involvement within the, the open source community that, uh, that Aston had and um, I could see that increasing and I kind of wanted to be a, be a part of it. Um, so I've been there yeah, about three years, actually uh, worked remotely, we're quite a, a dispersed team and that's actually um, got some parallels with how open source projects are generally structured. Um, you're not generally talking about um, one team of people in um, a given location, you're talking about people distributed um, quite often um, globally, um, collaborating generally via the internet. And uh, sometimes at Aston it feels a bit like that. Um, I go down to the office, I don't know, probably every six weeks, something like that. Um, the rest of the time it's working um, remotely or, or with clients. And uh, it's just a, a nice, um, nice way to work in, in this day and age. So, um, looking at the open source community, um, kind of Who's involved? Um, well, there are thousands of individuals um, involved, hundreds of organizations probably in the geospatial um, community. Um, and it's really worth um, just taking a second to consider that um, we're talking here about the UK um, QGIS user group and the Welsh part of that, so like a, a small part of a, um, an already fairly small um, community. Um, that's kind of part of the wider open source geospatial community. And then outside there, there's an even wider community of, um, of open source um, software just in, in general IT. And there's many, many niches and um, many people with specific focus. But there are literally thousands of people who are actively involved in contributing to, to open software. Um, and the movement's been around for, for many years. You know, uh, some of the projects that we use today um, have been around for 15, 20 years. Um, so there's some real heritage there. And it's only just recently that um, the, the adoption has really picked up um, to such a level. And it's, you know, it's fantastic to see this many people at an event like this, which I say is a small part of a, a small user group on a particular piece of software, QGIS. Um, it's, it's really great to see. In terms of um, key organizations um, in the, the open source geospatial community, you know, our area, um, the, the key um, organization is um, OSGO. Can we have a show of hands as to how many people have heard of OSGO? Okay, good, good number. 
Um, so OSGEO is, is a foundation, so not for profit, um, actually incorporated in, in the US. Um, it was originally kind of bankrolled by um, Autodesk. Um, it's quite common for these foundations to um, come about through some form of corporate sponsor. Autodesk basically had um, some software they wanted to make open source, which was MapGuide, um, and they needed someone to kind of own it, own the, the intellectual property. And they approached a few people that were already active on various other projects that were um, well used and uh, discussed setting up a foundation. OSG was kind of born out of that. Um, Autodesk have kind of taken a back seat almost entirely for OSGEO now, and you don't hear very, very many people actually using um, MapGuide open source either, um, as it happens, but many other people have um, got involved, other um, corporate sponsors have been found, um, and OSGEO kind of lives on today and um, is, a, is a very vibrant and diverse community. I and mean, it's home to a lot of the, the major projects that um, you're probably familiar with, things like PostGIS, the spatial extension for the Postgres database, um, GeoServer, MapServer. Um, I should probably have put QGIS on there. Um, that's where QGIS user group. Um, but QGIS has been part of the, the OSGO um, banner for a long time. And they kind of provide um, a central focal point um, for the community. And they also provide things like um, governance and legal aid and those sorts of things to the various um, open source projects. So they're a really important um, organization. Uh, there's, a, there's a board of directors, which I think has six or eight people um, on it um, who kind of run the, um, the foundation from a kind of administrative and um, leadership point of view. But then there are thousands of others that, that, are, that are involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's an annual conference called FOS4G, um, and we were lucky enough to host it here in the UK um, just a few months back, as Sean mentioned. Um, that was a fantastic event. We ran it just after the AGI conference up in Nottingham. Um, 850 people attended from all over the world. Had a really good um, number of delegates that came from uh, the UK and Europe, um, which was one of the, the key aims. You know, each time Fossil G is hosted, um, it's hosted in a, a particular country, and the aim is to try and get those in the, that country and surrounding countries to um, come and participate and engage with, with the community, as well as facilitating um, kind of the meeting of the tribes, so those people that have been involved in the community for, for a long time, coming together to um, spend some time and uh, work out what's, what's next for them. Um, OSGO provide a whole host of other things, including things like um, infrastructure, things like mailing lists, and um, they have a whole host of IRC, so internet relay chat channels, that um, you can join. You can uh, join those just for general information and discuss them. There's the, the OSGO um, discuss list, which is kind of the main um, list where you'll hear about events and generally what people are, are uh, doing in the, the community. And then there are, um, I think, probably hundreds, actually, of other um, lists on specific topics. So they can be thematic topics, such as um, particular subject areas, and then there are lists for the individual software um, projects that people are involved in, so GeoServer, QGIS, etc. Um, and generally, for the larger projects, you've got like a dev list for um, developers that are actually involved in um, writing the software, and then a users list as well for things like help and um, general conversation around the use of, of software. So they provide quite a lot of, of infrastructure, and there's a critical mass of, um, of community around. It's also worth mentioning at this point there's another foundation on the scene as well, which people um, perhaps might not be aware of, called Location Tech. Um, it's relatively new, although it's part of... Um, a much larger group. Uh, the Eclipse Foundation um, are um, a large group uh, that was actually born out of IBM um, who uh, tend to deal with large enterprise systems. Um, I think they're on the steering group of things like Java. Um, and um, they have fairly recently, the last few years, set up Location Tech as a focus on geospatial. And they're really looking more towards the, the enterprise market. They're looking to um, provide um, assurance that the open source geospatial software that they um, generally work with is suitable for use in large enterprise um, environments. And um, there are a lot of people from the OSGEO community involved in location tech and, and vice versa. And I think generally it's seen as a, a positive step because it's showing that um, larger organizations are looking towards um, these projects that have been around for, for some time and having confidence in them that they, they can deliver. Um, the equivalent of, of the proprietary software they may have once used. 
There's also um, the concept of local chapters within um, OSGO. And if you haven't heard of um, the UK local chapter of OSGO, um, then you have now. And it would be a really good time to join the, um, the OSGO UK list. So there's a, a mailing list. Um, most local chapters have a, a list. In the States, there are local chapters which are um, mainly, I think, statewide. Um, it's quite common, though, outside of the States to have um, countrywide lists. So there's UK, there's France, there's Japan, Germany, etc. Um, OSGO UK um, has been running for um, some time now, I think probably about six or eight years. Um, Joe Cook, who actually now works with us at Aston, originally kicked off the the UK chapter. Joe's been um, active for, for a long while. Um, you might know her as Archeogeek if you're on Twitter. That's a, um, a pseudonym. Um, and she, um, she set up the UK chapter after attending a uh, Fossil G event. Um, and it's, it's gone on to um, attract people from um, throughout the UK, both in public sector, private sector, and uh, a whole host of other um, organisations. Um, it's fairly active. It was very active on the run-up to um, organising Phosphor G. Um, that was an extremely busy time. Um, and very few people seem to know that um, we run a conference called um, OSGIS. Um, so OSGIS is kind of the, um, the UK, although actually we attract a European audience generally, um, conference for open source geospatial. Um, it's normally held up in Nottingham, although there's some talk that it may move next year, and it's normally around the September sort of time. Um, generally a really good event, runs over a couple of days, um, has workshops um, on the one day, and then presentations um, on the next. And as I say, we get, get a really good audience, both from the UK and um, Europe. We also get a few um, from elsewhere that, um, that come along to talk on particular um, projects. Generally quite technical. Um, but um, accessible from um, a user standpoint. If you're, if you're an active user of QGIS, for instance, you'd like to get um, something out of it. Um, so join the list. Um, the OSGO UK chapter is at um, osgo.org slash UK, and you can find information on there um, about the list and future events, those sorts of things. Um, and there's also things like a list of um, resources like training providers, those sorts of things. Um, tailored around the UK market. Um, and I'm actually responsible for keeping the training page up to date. If anybody here knows of any training that's going on, be that paid or free, um, or any workshops that people are running, then um, let me know via the list and we'll make sure that that gets updated on the site so that um, people know what's going on. Um, so how does it work? How does like the open source model work? Um, got a lot of people using um, software like like QGIS, but it's quite nice to have a bit of background as to um, how the software is originally developed and then and then released. So there are two um, common ways that um, the software becomes open source. Um, one is that it's built for a purpose and then released, so it's built to satisfy a particular need, um, and then it's released as open software because it's thought that it could be generally more useful, um, or people are hoping for collaboration to, to um, improve it and move it on further. Um, and then there's also software that just starts out as open source software. That was kind of the in intent from the very start. People are, um, are in tune to the fact that there, there are benefits of um, developing in the open and making it available. And um, therefore, there's funding from, from the very outset. So I've got a couple of examples. Um, so these are examples that I've been involved in. So there's Loader. Um, so this is a tool for loading GML data. Um, real nuts and bolts stuff. You know, It's taking raw data from the Ordnance Survey. Um, or indeed any other um, XML-based geographic data, so that could be KML or GML from somewhere else, um, and transforming it, adding some value to it, and then loading it into either a spatial database or flat files or um, something similar. So it's very much like it's a utility. Um, we built it um, at Aston um, in-house. We had a need to load national cover of um, OS Master Map and VML um, for some... Um, data services that we provide. Um, so we needed a way of getting the data into, in our case, a Postgres database. Um, and then we decided to release that as open source. We felt that um, it was something that others could benefit from. Um, at the time, there weren't any other um, free and open um, loaders for this sort of data. Um, I feel that 
the ordinance so providing data in these open forms is great, but having to pay money then in order just to take the data they provide and get it into a format that you can use um, seems a little skewed. Um, you're kind of almost paying twice, you're paying for the right to use the data, then the right to um, transform the data into a usable format. Um, we, um, we released Loader and um, the take-up has been, been fantastic. Within uh, two days of releasing it, I posted to the OSGO UK list and some guys that are now at uh, Lutra Consulting, who are um, a small consultant firm that work in the um, hydrology space, actually with QGIS quite, quite a lot, had built a QGIS plugin that basically uses the, the core functionality in Loader and allows you to pick a file and translate it. Um, in their case, into a shape file that's suitable for, for use in, in uh, QGIS. So within two days, we'd kind of already seen a benefit of, of releasing the software. That was great. Um, and then from there, it's, it's just gone on. People have um, contributed um, support for other, other formats. People have contributed code to, um, to improve um, what Loader does itself. And we've ha also had contributions like um, the styles that Matt Travis has, uh, has put together for styling uh, master map and VML. In, um, in QGIS, and that's all compatible with, with Loader. So um, for us, um, we haven't made any money out of Loader. In fact, we have. We've done some consulting around Loader. You know, we provided some consulting for clients that wanted to um, to smooth the workflow of getting the data through. So that's good. Um, but we've, we've gained a lot by releasing some software, getting some stuff back, um, and hopefully we've made a, a contribution to the, the community as a whole. Um, Another example would be the QGIS Gazetteer plugin. Um, so the loader we kind of built and then released. That was fine. We built it for a, a reason, and we're happy to then release it. The QGIS Gazetteer plugin was a different story. So there, um, we had a need for a Gazetteer plugin, and then we also had some customers um, that use our, our iShare tool for publishing the data on their website. Um, Surrey Heath and actually Simon Miles at uh, Windsor and Maidenhead. Um, both of them said, look, we're using QGIS, we're looking to roll it out more widely, but one thing that's really missing is a good address search. Um, they had a good address search as a web service in the iShare software that we provide, and they basically wanted a way to um, have a panel in QGIS that could go off, search their, um, their LLPG, um, and then present the results to center the map. So very simple um, concept. It didn't exist. Um, so we basically had some... Um, some split funded development there. So um, Surrey Heath, that's James Rutter at Surrey Heath, um, Simon Miles at Windsor and Maidenhead, and, and Aston um, put in some money um, in order to fund the development of, of this plugin. And we actually didn't do that work as it happened initially. Um, back at the time when it was originally um, developed, we hadn't done much around developing plugins for, for QGIS. Um, we felt we needed to do it properly, so we actually commissioned one of the core. Um, QGIS developers, Nathan Woodrow, guy who uh, lives over in Australia, um, to basically do the, the first version of it. So that was a, a really nice um, example of some funded development. It was a small amount of development, so uh, which is actually often quite a good way to go for these sorts of projects, keep it nicely defined and, um, and very um, easy to manage as a, uh, as a project. And Nathan went ahead built the, the first version of the plugin and then and now that was released. So Surrey Heath and Windsor Mainhead got their Gazetteer plugin um, for much less than they would have paid for uh, the development otherwise. Um, and we were then able to help other um, clients of ours to uh, make use of the, the plugin and their, their address search. And from there, um, others have, have picked it up. So um, you guys have over at uh, Heathport Albert, which is fantastic. Um, Matt Travis did. Um, I think that may have actually been how Matt Travis and Simon Miles kind of got to, to know each other. Um, and um, several others um, have also then picked up and used it. Um, and there's also been um, some further collaboration and enhancements, things like QGIS2 compatibility, um, some additions of um, alternative search sources so you can search your own LLPG or you can search um, the OpenStreetMap um, Place Gazetteer or GeoNames, a whole host of, of different options um, that have all been kind of contributed to, to again, this fairly small small project. Um, and then the next example, um, Bruce Jackson is here. Hi, Bruce. 
um, from Natural Resources Wales. And just recently, we've been lucky enough to work with um, with Bruce and uh, his team to build a custom web application. So this is just some sort of custom dev work uh, to build an application um, on behalf of Natural Resources Wales. Um, the application is actually around um, looking at the impact of fishing um, in the seas around, in this case, Anglesey. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of um, background that's gone into the project, and we were asked to come in and, and build an application to allow people to, to view the results of all of this work that had gone on to assess the impact, surveys of, of fishermen, surveys of habitat, um, uh, bring it all together into a, um, a coherent um, web application for both members of the public, fishermen, and fishing bodies and official bodies to, to um, hopefully gain some insight. Um, and Natural Resources Wales were um, forward-thinking enough to think that instead of having somebody build them an application and then basically be locked in um, with a particular vendor, they wanted it released as, as open software. So that's the approach that we've taken. So it was a, a funded development um, very much to the specification of Natural Resources Wales, but the application as a whole has been released as open source um, software. And there are some benefits of that. Um, for one, Natural Resources Wales now have the right to go on and further develop and enhance that application themselves if they wish, um, and reuse parts of it um, within their, their organization. But also similar bodies, um, both within the UK and the rest of the world, could reuse um, the application for similar um, studies, um, and also people could reuse just individual components of that application in their own <coughs> custom applications. Um, and that's a model that um, we haven't done a great deal of um, up to now, but I can see it being much more commonplace um, going forward. Um, so, what, so that's kind of how things kind of get started, and how you kind of get to a point where something's been built and is available. But what about ongoing development? Um, so there are a couple of options are there, and a few examples. Um, funded features, this is increasingly common. So for the larger projects in particular, if there's an organization that has a particular need, um, they may choose to fund a new feature um, for a, a, a particular piece of software. And a really great example is the Ordnance Survey, who funded some work on, um, on the GeoServer um, engine for publishing spatial data on the web. Um, they funded um, WMS 1.3 support, um, and that was off the back of, of Inspire. So in order to be Inspire compliant, the preference is to use the latest version of the, uh, the various um, standards for publishing um, geographic information on the web, and uh, GeoServer didn't quite um, meet WMS 1.3, so the Ordnance Survey put some money towards um, one of the vendors, in fact, in this case, um, Boundless Geo, who um, employ a number of the, the core contributors to um, GeoServer, um, and they were able to build out that, that functionality. Uh, and then the rest of the community can benefit. So you see quite a bit of that. But it's a really nice example in, in the UK with the Ordnance Survey of, of funded. Um, Kickstarter and similar um, crowdfunding arrangements. So you, we're starting to see a bit of this in the community where um, projects are looking towards um, funding by kind of micropayments. So uh, most people are probably familiar with Kickstarter. People go along, pitch an idea, um, are looking to reach a particular funding goal. If they meet that goal, then um, they'll go ahead and build whatever it is. That could be a book, it could be a piece of software, it could be a physical product of some description. Um, and then generally, people that have backed the, um, the idea then have some form of reward. They might get um, attribution, so their name um, as a contributor to, the, to funding the software. They might get a T-shirt. They might get the software itself. Um, all sorts of different levels of, um, of reward for for pitching in and, and funding a particular um, venture. Um, a really good example currently has been OpenLayers 3. So OpenLayers is um, the, the toolkit that people um, have used for, for many years for displaying web maps. Um, there's been a push towards version 3, which is quite a big, um, big rewrite. And there was um, an Indiegogo, which is like a, um, a slightly more um, I guess a slightly more community-focused Kickstarter um, outfit, where basically people have um, pledged certain amounts of money, um, generally fairly small amounts of money, um, to 
basically fund the development. So similar to funded features, but generally from a much wider source. Um, and like I say, it seems to be becoming a more popular um, approach, both inside the geospatial community and, and out in the wider world. Um, and then key are contributions from the community. So you get lots of um, enhancements that come into things like QGIS um, that came from the, the wider community. Some of those are funded, um, some not, um, some from organizations, from, some from individuals. Um, and you'll see that on any of the, the projects, you've normally got a core um, of core committees that are making um, a big commitment to the, the project, and then a long tail of uh, other contributors that are making small contributions. Um, but because of the number, it becomes really significant. And this is one of the real key ways that open source um, really works. And one of the things I kind of want to impress today is um, how everybody can contribute, and even small contributions make a big, big impact. There's a kitten, just as a break. I didn't have many pictures. Um, and it's generally customary for open source events to have cuddly things, so kitten. Um, so contributing. Um, so how can you actually um, not just use the, the software, but contribute back to the, the community? Um, and there are kind of several tiers of, of contributing, if you like. Um, and I don't want to kind of put a, a value on each because I think even the smallest contribution is very valuable. And I think most people in the, the community <coughs> tend to agree. Um, but they kind of go from a fairly modest contribution right up to um, really making a, a commitment. So there are many ways to contribute to open source software besides writing code. Um, it's all about software, isn't it? That's all the terminology is all about software. And the focus tends to be on the code itself. Um, there's a lot of talk of um, repositories for code and people contributing um, back to them. But actually, there are a whole host of ways that you can contribute that don't involve writing code at all. Um, and another key thing is you don't have to be active from day one. It's absolutely fine to use the software. Just, just use it. Don't contribute back. But as you um, continue to use it, you're probably going to want to interact with the community more and hence start making more of a, a contribution. But it's kind of key that there's no one saying that you download QGIS and install it, you've got to do something to contribute back. That's kind of against the whole ethos. But generally, the community um, works in such a way that people tend to want to. They want to contribute. And that's kind of the positive um, side. And that's when things really work well. So I've got a list of things that you can do. So join join a list, or join a list. Join a list. Um, so become part of a community and find help and inspiration. So you can join the OSGO UK list. That'd be a really good start. Um, many people here are probably already part of the QGIS UK group on Google+. Uh, that's also a really good start. Um, please remember, when you join a list, if you join one for a, a piece of software, ask nicely. This is really key. You see a lot of people that will join a, a list, they've been using the software for a while, they've got a problem, and they'll charge in and say, this is broken, this is broken, I can't get this to work, somebody help me. And they don't get a very good response, generally because um, the lists are community run, and people expect you both to be kind and considerate and all those things that we just should be anyway, um, but also to have um, taken the time to ensure that they've kind of looked into their issues enough, read up. There's generally documentation you can read. Um, there's generally um, mailing list archives that you can go through just to try and get a um, bottom out your problem before <laughs> then going and, and screaming for attention to the world. So just kind of be, be courteous. And generally, you'll then get a really positive response. Um, once you've asked for help a few times, you might then want to help some other people. Um, there are always people, I'll say this several times in this talk, there are always people that know less than you. Um, when you first get involved in a community, you think, crikey, I hardly know anything here. There's real experts. And you think, I don't really feel like I can actually contribute. But you've got to remember, if you've been using um, QGIS for six months, there's going to be someone that's only just picked it up, and they haven't even installed it yet. And they can really benefit from um, that sort of real novice help. And as you get... Um, more and more experience, you're going to be able to help people that are just a little bit behind you. 
Um, it's a very big community, and there are lots of people at lots of different levels in, in the, uh, the learning spectrum, if you like. Uh, you can find the lists at list.osgo.org. There are lots of them. Beware, there are lots of them. But if you have a look through, you'll find some that you recognize, pieces of software, things like QGIS. Um, and lists like the general discuss list are a good bet for finding out about events and the likes. Um, that other link there, these slides are, um, will be available um, online, so you, you don't have to copy it down, um, is actually a kind of a recipe for asking for help. Um, and there's a lot to it, but there are a few um, bullet lists throughout, worth having to skim through, and just um, it's kind of distilled knowledge from people that have run lists and help forums and things for many, many years. And it kind of, you read through and you think, yeah, maybe I should do that. So, um, for instance, I, um, I found an issue the other day with some, um, some software that does data translation that we use for, for Loader. Um, and I was pretty sure it was a bug. Um, but in order to actually ask on the list, I kind of needed to, to get it down to the simplest possible case where I could see that there was a, a problem. So it was really easily reproducible. And then be able to post the list and say, I'm doing this, this, and this. Here's an example of what I'm running, the software that I'm using, so the version and operating system I'm on, I'm on, that sort of thing. And here's some sample data that you can use to reproduce it. Um, you take that sort of approach, you get a really good response. People just pick it up, look at it, can understand it. They will quite often take your sample data, run it through, and actually reproduce it themselves, and then we'll be able to, to give you a, a reply. And in that particular case, I think I posted um, at 8 o'clock in the morning, while well on the train, actually. Um, and then by the time that I'd got in the office down in Epsom, um, there were two replies, um, both of which were actually exactly what I was after. It wasn't a bug. I just missed one of the... Um, some configuration settings, and yeah, that, that's lovely. So, really nice example. But if you just take a little bit more time to prepare your your question, same for things like um, Stack Exchange. If people use use that, the GIS Stack Exchange, prepare your your question so that people can understand it and hopefully reproduce it themselves. You're going to get a much better response. So, moving on from the list, you can then create an issue. So, if you've found a bug and it's not known, report it. And this sort of thing, it kind of sounds obvious, doesn't it? R report issues that you find. But actually, it does actually take a bit of effort sometimes to report an issue. So sometimes I'll bump into something. I'm busy doing something else. And I'll think, oh, that's pretty sure that's a bug, do we, getting that logged. You think, oh, but I haven't got time to do it now because I need to get on and do something else. I need to solve the problem. But it's really valuable if you do. If you just step back, take half an hour to actually go through that um, that stage again of trying to um, narrow down what, what the issue is, get it reproducible, and then um, report it on, on the project bug tracker. If you don't report it, it's likely that someone else will, but it might take a couple of weeks, and in that time, um, another 10 people may have already wait, may have waited the same time that you did by bumping into it and um, getting frustrated. So if you can, if you've got the, the technical knowledge, try and um, report issues back to, to the various projects. Um, there's no kind of central place to report stuff. It depends on the project. Um, a lot of projects are hosted these days on GitHub, um, and GitHub have um, the concept of issues, and that's basically raising a ticket to say, I found this issue, um, these are the details, and then you can have some correspondence with um, whoever's um, responsible for the development um, about um, both um, reproducing it and then hopefully going forward and, and getting it fixed. Um, so research your issue thoroughly, explain in detail, and try and make it easy, easy to reproduce. And I understand those things aren't necessarily easy for everybody to do. But if you feel you're confident enough with that particular piece of software, you're going to make a good contribution if you can. Um, write a post. Um, so if you've done something um, and um, you think, oh, quite pleased with that. Um, I've managed to achieve something with a particular piece of software. Um, Write about it. Tell people about it. Um, because, again, there are always people that are a step behind you, and they'll, they'll benefit. Don't think you've got to be an expert in order to write about QGIS. You haven't got to be a core developer to write about QGIS. You can write about some of the simplest stuff, and there'll be people that will benefit um, from it. Um, and you'll find a whole host of, of um, blogs um, that write on technical subjects. Um, they're aggregated, those that relate to OSGO, at slash aggregator. Um, you'll also find communities like the Google Plus community where P 
people post about their experience. And there's been some really good content um, recently where people have both um, posted, look, I've done this, and also provided some work, work examples. And that's so invaluable um, because it, it means that people both get inspired and um, people, when they find an issue, they can Google it and find a reasonable response. One of the biggest differences I find between working with proprietary software and open source software is I find answers to problems easier to find via the internet because the community is generally in a mindset where they want to share their experience. They're writing blog posts, they're writing to forums, they're um, posting to lists, and that's tremendously valuable. Generally, with proprietary software, you've got a one or two forums that are controlled by um, that organization. People don't tend to blog um, quite so readily, um, and you just don't tend to get the, the community involvement and the, the amount of information um, published, particularly if you've got to rely on a particular vendor writing articles about, about their software. Much better to see it from the community. Contribute to documentation. So again, all this stuff so far has not been writing code. Um, projects are always looking for improved documentation. Um, the, the quality of documentation and, and quantity varies quite substantially. Um, but even making small contributions to documentation, things like correcting an error, um, can be, be very valuable because everybody can benefit. Everyone that reads that page is going to benefit from, from small correction. Um, you can flesh out a section if there's a particular area um, that you've done work with, like the print composer or whatever. You can provide some additional um, information. Usage examples are always key. Quite often people will um, document software in terms of the, the mechanics of it, but then they don't uh, have time to then go and put in place real world usage, usage examples. If you can do that and you can provide, uh, if you need data for it, you can provide um, links to the data that's freely available. Um, we've got a lot of open data nowadays. Uh, making use of that to provide examples, that can be um, really helpful and um, perhaps not so relevant for, for us in the UK, but for the rest of the world, providing translation is, is a big thing. Um, you might want to do a Welsh language translation, I guess, but uh, maybe not. Um, in other countries, um, there's normally quite an effort to translate the, the more popular projects into the the native language, um, just to uh, expand the reach. Now we are getting on to, to writing code, so you can fix a bug. Um, if you're looking to um, contribute to an open source project by writing code, really want to start with fixing a bug. You don't want to kind of go in all guns blazing and say, hey guys, I've got this big new feature. There we go. Um, because most features that are developed in the community are developed in a collaborative manner. Generally, they're developed in a way where someone goes along and proposes it, um, people discuss the merits of it being included, um, and then there's um, basically some consensus reached as to the shape of it before it's then actually developed. It's not always that case, but that's generally how it, how it works. Uh, most mature projects don't take too kindly on people coming along and dropping a big feature on them, unless it's some stroke of genius where people go, oh, why don't we think of that and I'm going to take it. But, um, Quite often, people will start with start out fixing a few bugs. So, if you're interested in um, a particular piece of software, take a look through its, um, its issue tracker. See if there are any issues that uh, you think you might be able to work on. Um, if you found an issue yourself, look to um, provide a, a fix or a patch for that, and then see about getting that, that contributed in. It really helps to build your confidence, the confidence of the community towards yourself, um, and basically ensures that you can um, have a, a nice easy on-ramp into to helping with a, with a project. An, an example here um, would be we've contributed back to well a number of projects but one recently called Map Proxy which is um, basically a proxy that sits between a WMS server and the outside world to in increase the performance. It um, sends off requests for areas of map and then tiles them um, internally, maintains an internal um, cache of that data to um, to allow you to serve many more clients than the, the original um, server would be able to. Um, so we've done quite a lot of work for our data services using Map Proxy, and we've fixed a number of small bugs around the edges, um, and that kind of um, got us to a position where um, we were both familiar with the, the people that uh, run the project, um, some guys um, from Om Omniscale um, over in the Netherlands, I think they are. Um, and um, then led the way to us being able to contribute um, more fully to the, um, the project. So actually we did some documentation work there, 
fix some bugs, and um, then we went on to, to do some more substantial work. Like contributing to the future. Oh, that's a good segue, wasn't it? Um, so contributing to the future is a much bigger undertaking. It doesn't always have to be a very big feature, um, but generally it's reasonably involved. Um, it's not just a case of writing some code and handling it off and it just being accepted. The QA process in open source software is generally quite tight. Um, it generally kind of needs to be because you're working with distributed groups of, of people. Um, you haven't got like a dev manager um, that everything needs to go through. You've got a dispersed group and you'll have various people that are responsible for um, various parts of the, the system. And you'll have people that will come in, do some work, and then perhaps leave, never be involved in that, that project again. So you need a way of ensuring that the code that goes in is of a good quality and good fit um, for the project. So often you'll, you'll write the code, you'll have to write the documentation that, um, that accompanies it um, so that you don't end up with a whole host of features that nobody really knows about. And then you'll have to write a whole host of tests that basically ensure that um, going forward, if there are changes made to the code, the tests can be run to check that your piece of functionality is functioning as it should be. Um, so the tests actually kind of act like a, a contract that your code is um, adhering to. So generally they're, they're unit tests, unit system tests. Um, so we contributed um, a feature to, to Mac Proxy. Um, it was a, a really sexy feature um, for applying things like watermarks and other graphical annotations to, to the images that were served out. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do is very sexy. <laughs> or not. Um, uh, and there, um, the, the amount of work that went into the documentation, the test, and actually the, the communication was probably, I don't know, four times that that went into the actual code. Um, so you write the code and you think, oh, that's it, done it, done the feature. And then there's a lot of um, other work to ensure that it's properly integrated. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very um, rewarding thing to do. And for us, it meant that we kind of had a core um, project, Mac Proxy, that did 90% of what we needed. There was this other small 10% that um, we needed to put in. We were able to do that, and we were able to do it in such a way that it was really maintainable for us. So we hadn't just kind of written something on top that when Mac Proxy changed, we'd have to keep maintaining. We did it um, in such a way that it ended up in the core product, and then it's kind of the end of our management um, headache then. Um, we'll continue to c contribute to it and um, evolve it as Mac Proxy evolves, but that's a, a much easier thing to do um, now that it's part of the, the core than maintaining something that it was kind of our idea just as a layer on top. It's worked out really well. And then the last thing, start something new. Um, and this could be a whole new project. Um, and new projects are created every second. Um, there's a, a collaborative site called GitHub, which um, you've probably heard um, people talk of. You heard me mention it several times today. Um, which is kind of the current thing in the open source community uh, at large. It's a bit like a social network for developers. Um, don't get much geekier than that, do you? Um, but uh, it, it allows people to host their, their projects, host the code, host the documentation, the tests, all of that, um, and provides um, a means of um, interacting with the community via issues, um, other people pro um, contributing via things called pull requests, um, and because GitHub is so easy, it provides a nice open um, platform for people to cl collaborate with. Um, there's been a massive increase in the number of projects that have been made available open source. Now, some of these, a lot of these, are very small, one-man projects doing um, individual things. You'll find hundreds <laughs> of projects that allow you to um, create a slideshow like this that runs in a browser. Hundreds of them because people think, ah, oh, I fancy writing a slideshow piece of software. And they'll write it and they'll release it on, on GitHub. Um, but you'll also find a whole host of geospatial projects and you'll find people putting together um, even things like their small utility scripts. They've got a little script that does something. Get it out there, get it published on, on, uh, on GitHub. And then it means that other people can find it and hopefully benefit from it. And people might not just take it and use your thing, but they'll learn from it. Um, when I learned web development, um, I th as I think most people did, they tend to have a book that kind of gives the background, yeah, all very well and good, 
Um, so I'd probably about a 50 page book that I read about six times. And then virtually everything else was learnt by right clicking and choosing view source in a browser. And you can see how other people have put together their, their website. And that was kind of a, that was a real thing back when people were, were learning web development. Um, and still is, I think, I think today. But now we've got sites like GitHub, which are making that even easier. You're able to review other people's work um, very easily. Uh, you think, I'd like to learn a new language. OK, well, I'll just find uh, people that are working in that language on, on the site. And you've got a whole host of, of really good reference material. Um, so it's, it's really, really important to try and share, share what you do. And GitHub is a good place. Um, some really great examples um, just recently um, around QGIS. So the QGIS styling for um, the OS data products. Um, so uh, is it Angus up in yeah. Um, Scotland? Yeah. yeah. He, um, I, I, only, I only know him by his Twitter handle. <laughs> um, he um, provided some QGIS styling um, for OS data loaded by Snowflake's uh, Go loader. And then Matt Travis followed up with the equivalent um, that are compatible with um, with Loader. Um, so those have been released. Um, they're just QGIS style files. Um, so it's not a sub substantial piece of work, but it's really valuable, really valuable to this community, because it means that you haven't then got to think, oh, I'd like to display some VML. Um, how do I start? You know, you could sit down for hours styling data like um, VML and Mastermind. If you've got a good starting place, then um, you're in a, a really good good position. And because it's been shared on something like GitHub, um, if you have amendments, if you want to add a, an additional classification for that level crossing that's been missed, that's just treated like um, <coughs> some other feature as it stands, you could go ahead, improve it, and contribute that back. And then hopefully the, the volume of knowledge and the, the quality will, will improve. Um, and then also there's been um, some cr contribute con contributions there you go, around um, the Gazetteer for um, searching LPG. Um, so here, this is a, a simple way of setting up um, a web service to connect to your <coughs> database with your LPG and make it available in the, the Gazetteer plugin. So again, a, a fairly modest contribution, but really important because it opens it up to a much, much wider audience. Um, so I guess what I'm saying, in, in summary, is don't be afraid to be actively involved in the community. You can start very small, and then there are a whole host of, of ways that you can contribute, some of which are very low friction, very easy, some of which are a bit more involved, but you can work up to it. Um, and most of all, it's a lot of fun. So thank you. Yeah.